morning, everybody. Happy New Year. It's great to see you. Uh, so glad to see your face and, and many new faces, too. It's awesome. Uh, just, just so glad that you are here. If you have a Bible, go with me to Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19. The words will be behind me, but I always, always encourage you to bring your Bible. If you, if you don't have a Bible, after this gathering, go to our guest services and say, I don't have one, and we will get you one. Uh, we'll, we'll go buy you one and love for, to give you the word of God. But Luke chapter 19. Again, Happy New Year. Uh, who in here enjoys, enjoys puzzles? Anybody in here like a, whoa, this is like a, okay, a lot of people enjoy puzzles. I was reading a book this week and it, it talked about puzzles. It was interesting. I started thinking about puzzles. You know when you open up that box of 1,000 pieces? Weirdos. No, uh, you know, you, you, you open up and you pour all those pieces out. Usually what doesn't happen is you don't pick up one of the pieces and go, I wonder who your friend is. Let's try to find it. You, know, you usually don't do that, do you? There's a strategy to figuring out the puzzle, isn't there? First, what, what do you do? Well, you got to flip all the pieces. It takes up a huge space. Then you find the corners. Then what's next? The, the, the edges. You get all the edges. Then, then, then you just pick up the box and stare at it and go, what am I doing? You know, you stare at the box. And, and you gather the colors together. Strategy, right? You, you figure out that there's a best way to do the puzzle other than just picking up the piece and going, I'm, I'm just going to stack them around here. Nobody does that. It's not the best strategy. There, there's a strategy in it. If you've been around the River Church for a while, you've, you've heard the words reach, gather, and grow. You've heard it over and over again because it's something that, that, that we preach over and over again. Every January... And every September, we speak on the mission and the vision of the church. That we believe the church, the strategy of the church, is to reach, to gather, and to grow. Now, this isn't because we're really clever here at the River Church. We believe it's just what the Bible says. The Bible says, and and a strategy is just a plan of action. We believe the plan of action for the church is to reach people, to gather together, and to grow. Now, all of that, all is around Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, we reach people with the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came and he died on the cross and he rose again. And we want to reach people because we want people to know about Jesus. So here at the church, we, we, we try to reach people. We want to go into the community. This isn't a holy huddle. We want to reach out and love people. We want people to know about the great Savior. And then we gather. We gather together. This is like our our corporate gathering. We gather together. We worship together. We're going to take communion together. We we hear the word of God preached. And then then our next step that we believe we're called to do if we're a follower of Jesus is to grow. Is to grow in the word and and to grow in, in knowing him, who he is, what the word of God says, how to be led by the spirit, how to listen to the Lord and to follow him. That's why we have growth communities and Wednesday nights and Sundays and Saturdays and all over the place because we believe reach, gather, and grow. And if you've been here a while, you, you, you've heard this before. You, you've heard it. Now, because it is our goal that if you come here the River Church, you go, you know what? I know what they're about. I, I know what it's about. And you know where the word talks about reach, gather, and grow. And then we also hope if somebody says, so what's the river all about? You got the answer. You don't have to go, well, uh, you, you know, to reach, to gather, and to grow, pointing people to Jesus. But there is this trend that happens, and I, I've seen it in our church. What happens is when we look to reach, we go, okay, church, what's the church going to do to reach people? And the church has done some amazing things to reach people. We've done Trunk or Treat. We do Easter Egg Hunt. We've done the Passion Play. We've done different huge events to reach people. But what happens, the trend is we go, "Um, so how's the church going to reach people? And then that leads us to to the gathering where where we have this expectation of the church of, okay, let's uh, have this gathering, the worship band and, 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 and the preaching. And we have this expectation of a gathering. And if we get really committed, then we come back to the church and say, church, staff, where is now a Bible study that I can get in to grow? And what happens is we put reach, 
gather and grow, and we say we put that on the church. Well, this month, the series is called 1v1. You saw the little clip of basketball, you know, one-on-one. See, this thing of reach, gather, grow is not a corporate church idea. And this month, I want to challenge you with something. See, I believe reach, gather, grow, if you know Jesus, it's personal. It's not a what the church is going to do. Well, it actually is what the church is going to do because the thing is, you're you're the church. And this reach, gather, grow, my, my challenge, my hope is you take it personal. We're going to talk about reach today. We're going to talk about grow next week. We're going to talk about gathering I believe these things should be done 1v1, one-on-one. See, I believe we all have appointments. I believe you have appointments with people one-on-one to reach them. I believe you have appointments, appointments that I can't make. I believe you have appointments with people to gather 1v1. And I know that looks different in our, in our, in our world these days and but I still believe it can be done. You have appointments, 1v1 to grow. And I want to challenge you with that this month. And for some of you, that can be scary and intimidating. I'm in the same boat. Let's be challenged personally how to reach, gather, and grow this year. Let's pray and we'll dive into the word. Lord Jesus, thank you for everyone that's here. Lord God, I'm so thankful that your spirit is real and it moves in people's hearts. And God, I am praying this morning that you will speak to people and you'll move in their lives. That this relationship with Christ is personal. So I pray that you lead me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I want to talk to you about reach. That if you're in here, and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you said, Christ, I'm no longer Lord, you are. And I believe you died on the cross and rose again, and I accept you as Savior. And Christ is your Savior. There should be this thing in you that pulls in you, that you want other people to know Jesus too. That that you just don't want to keep Jesus to yourself. That if, if you know that Jesus has saved your life, that, that Jesus has reached you and you have life in him and he's transformed you, there should be this pull in you to want other people to know Jesus too. One of the famous verses in the Bible, Bible Matthew 28, says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. This is what... Jesus told the disciples to do, I believe he's what he tells us to do, that we're to go make disciples. What is it to make a disciple? A disciple is somebody who trusts Jesus, who then is now growing in him to be what Christ wants him to be. We're called to personally reach people. Jesus gives us multiple examples. When Jesus was here on earth, he gives us multiple examples of him one-on-one, personally reaching out to people. In John chapter 4, there's a story, if you haven't read it before, I challenge you this week to do it. John 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well, and he has this conversation with her. He cares for her. He gives her the truth, and she is saved. Two weeks ago, I talked to you about a man named Nathaniel in John chapter 1, where Jesus had this personal conversation with Nathaniel. In John chapter 3, there's this Pharisee, his name's Nicodemus, and what's crazy is Nicodemus says, sets up a private night conversation with Jesus because I, I think he's concerned that people think he's, like, he's going to talk with Jesus, and that's not very good. Jesus meets with them one-on-one. This morning, I wanna, I'm going to um, read you one of the stories, another story where Jesus meets one-on-one with someone. It's Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 Read a few verses. The Bible says this. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief 
tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was a wee little man. No, it's not what it says. But if any of you grew up in church, it's all you're thinking right now. You're not even listening to the verses. You're just singing the song of Zacchaeus because he was a wee little man and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord. Some of you who weren't in church, all these people are weird, all right? If you didn't grow up in church, but those who did and were in kids' church, everybody sang this song. So get it out of your mind. Let's look to the word of God, all right? The Bible says, so he ran on ahead, and he climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he's about to pass that way. Stop it, all of you. (laughs) And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, who? The crowd who came to see Jesus It's amazing how the crowd changed so quickly. They all grumbled. He has gone to be with the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house. If you have your own Bible I encourage you to circle that. Today, salvation has come to this house, since he is also the son of Abraham. For the son of man, who Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. This is so beautiful. Jesus comes to this earth. And there's a crowd, who knows of how many hundreds of people, and Jesus makes it personal. Jesus sees Zacchaeus up in in a tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. This is personal. I want you to know, I'm so glad my relationship with Jesus is personal. I'm glad that he came to this earth and he died on the cross for me. And he died on the cross personally for you. Not the crowd, but for you. See, this relationship with Jesus, Jesus' love is for you personally. And maybe there's someone in here just needs to hear that this morning. No matter where you've been or where you've gone, his love is for you. He loves you, and he died on the cross personally for you. And he meets with Zacchaeus. Now, I love studying Bible stories that I grew up learning. Here's why I love it, because when I was 10 years old and I heard the Bible story, now when I dive into the word, man, it's so much deeper. I see it afresh. And I want to challenge you. There are some of you who have heard this story, but see it afresh this morning. I'm probably more excited that there are some of you in here who've never heard the story of Jesus and how he met with Zacchaeus. You get to hear it for the very first time. But to dive into the depths of what the Bible says, here's a really bad illustration. On Disney Plus right now, there's this really lame show called Mandalorian. Now, I don't think it's lame. I really like Mandalorian, and I've been watching it. Okay, it's a Star Wars thing, so you just put me in a Star Wars box. But, and so I watched, started watching Mandalorian, and I, I've enjoyed it. I've liked it. I'm not a huge Star Wars guy. I just like the show. Well, Mitchell Holmes, who is our children's director here, he is a total Star Wars dork. Like, he loves, he loves Star Wars. Some of you like that out there. So he comes and talks to me about Mandalorian. He's like, well, do you know this character is actually from this story back here and then and this planet? If you knew what happened on this planet, you would really understand what's happening in Mandalorian. So I was like, fine. And now I've had to go back and watch the things earlier so I understand what's happening here. Now I know some of you just said you're a Star Wars guy. I'm not. That's okay. And some of you went, you're a Star Wars guy. Okay, I like you even more. But why I tell you that illustration? Because in the Bible, when you start studying the word and you start seeing the places, you start seeing the timeline, you see what's happening, it helps you understand it so much better. Like in the story of Zacchaeus in 19, it says Jesus entered Jericho. You've heard of Jericho before if you know the Old Testament. 
But Jericho at this time, time is a powerful city. It is very, very wealthy. And Jesus is on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem. Well, why? Because Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. The timeline here is this is the last really one-on-one that we see. See, Jesus then heads to Jerusalem. He does the triumphal entry, and seven days later, he dies on the cross. So he's in Jericho, a powerful city. And then there's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Now, he wasn't just a tax collector. See, Jesus had disciples that were following him, and Matthew, one of his disciples, was a tax collector. But Zacchaeus was different. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. The Bible says he was the chief tax collector. The tax collectors reported to him. He he, he was the chief in Jericho. See, there are three main hubs for collecting taxes. Jerusalem, Jericho, um, and then one other city. It it slips me. Capernaum. What, What Roy preached on last night. Capernaum. There were three of them. They were the head tax cities. And this It's where Zacchaeus was. And we know Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist is baptizing some people and baptizing some tax collectors. And John turns to them and says, hey, as you do your job, stop doing what most tax collectors do and stealing more than you should. This is what tax collectors were known for. Zacchaeus is most likely despised by people. The Bible very clearly says this. He's the chief tax collector, and he is rich. Well, Jesus is coming to town, and Zacchaeus, being a shorter man, can't see. So he kind of puts the pride aside, runs out ahead, and climbs up the sycamore tree. Sycamore tree around 40 feet tall. He climbs up in the sycamore tree. Why? Because it says he was seeking to see who Jesus was. I circled that also here. As we reach people, I want you to know, here's what we're called to do. Show people who Jesus is. That's what it is to reach people. We show people who Jesus really is. Zacchaeus climbs up to the tree. Who knows if he's hiding behind the, the, the leaves, you know, hoping people don't see him. And Jesus sees him and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I have an appointment at your house today. So Zacchaeus comes down quickly. They go to his house and something happens there. We don't have the whole story, but here's what we know. Today... Salvation has come to this house. That day, Zacchaeus' life changed. That day, Zacchaeus was reached by Jesus. Salvation came to that house. I had a pretty incredible Christmas. Christmas Eve, my family came over to my house. And uh, my dad... uh, I don't know how else to say this. My dad's like the godfather of the family. <laughs> He's, what I mean by that is my dad has led so many people in my family to the Lord. Like he just, uh, I'll, I'll have my nieces will, will bring over like uh, their fiance or their boyfriend. They come over and my dad goes, hey, we need to have a conversation. And my dad has led many to the Lord. And Christmas Eve, we gathered together here and I had a Christmas Eve gathering, and we went back to my house, and my niece's fiancé went to my dad and said, hey, I need to have a conversation with you. You know what happened? Something really amazing happened. Salvation came to the house that day. And it was so exciting. Like, it doesn't get much better at that than Christmas. Lots of gifts. Yay. Salvation comes to the house. And somebody knows Jesus, this personal, amazing meeting where salvation came. Now, I want to show you here what's incredible is what Zacchaeus does. 
Zacchaeus comes to the Lord and it says he stands and says, Jesus, I will give half of my stuff to the poor. And then if I have wronged anyone, I will return to them fourfold of what I've done wrong to them. Now I want you to understand this. He didn't do this to get saved. He wasn't going, okay, I'm going to do this now, Jesus. And when I do this, then when I die, you'll accept me into heaven. No, no, no. What happened is he accepted Jesus as Savior. Salvation came and the love in his life changed. The love for this world, the love for money, the the lust after those things, it changed. And he went, Jesus, you've changed me. Now I'm different. Now the things that used to mean so much to me, man, they're so much smaller now. Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give because I love you. What is also so interesting, why did he pick fourfold? Why did he say, okay, whatever I've stolen, I'm going to give fourfold back. Why did he say that? Well, in the Old Testament, the law, if you were caught being a thief, the law gave how you were supposed to give back. A fifth of it, one fifth. It would give ways that you had to give back. Zacchaeus picked the worst. He's like, if I'm the very worst, this is what the law says to give back. I'll just, I'm the very worst. I'll give back the most that the law required. Because that was now his heart. It's beautiful. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. There's some words that come to my mind and probably your mind when I talk about one-on-one reaching people. One of those things is, I feel like it's impossible. I feel like it's so difficult. You you don't know my father-in-law who we've been trying to reach. You don't know my my brother. You don't know my neighbor. You don't know, you don't know. It's, It's so difficult. I love how God placed this story that happened in Luke 19. Because in Luke 18, The Bible tells us another story about the rich ruler that came to him. The rich ruler in in Luke 18, 24, it says, Jesus seeing that he had become sad, the rich young ruler, because Jesus challenged him. He said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? You want to know what the answer is Jesus gives? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Whew. I'm going to have to tell you all something. We're on the rich side of the scale, no matter where we're at in this country. We're, we're on the rich side of the scale. And here Jesus goes, it's more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to come to know Jesus. Now, there's many thought, what does this mean? Some people say, well, back then they had this little door that camels had to get down and slither through. I I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it's talking about this. Why? Because when you keep reading, Jesus says this. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Let me say that again. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. Here's the truth. You can save no one. Impossible with man. But here's what we know. Possible with God. That God steps into people's lives. God stepped into my, how about your life? God stepped into some of your lives out there. He transformed your life. He saved you. Why? Because man, it's impossible, but watch what God can do. And when you hear that one-on-one, you're like, I don't know. Listen, watch what God will do. The second thing you may be thinking is, that sounds really lonely. I I don't know all the answers. I I don't. And you go, man, here, you're not alone. You're not alone. This 1v1, I'm not telling you, go alone. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says this, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Who's going with you? The Lord. If you know Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. 
You're not alone. John 17, 11 says this. Jesus is praying for the disciples, and I believe, I believe praying for us. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Who's that talking about? It's talking about the church. We're together on this. We're there for each other. We're there to help each other and to support each other. And you're not alone because we do this together. This month, we're going to talk about what it means for Reach, Gather, Grow to be personal. I'd love for you to take the challenge. If you know Jesus, now I'm going to challenge you with a couple things. Here's what I think 1v1 reach looks like. First, I'll go through these really quickly. First, you have to learn to share your story. Share your story. And I know some of you think, but it's not complete. Well, I'm glad it's not complete because when it's complete, well, share your story of how God changed your life. And for some of you, truly, God reached, feel, you feel like you were reached out of the depth of hell and he saved you. Uh-huh. Tell your story. Where did God show up? What did he do? How did he save you? How did he change you? Learn to share that story. Some of you grew up in a church home with amazing parents. Man, share your story. In the Bible, you watch how they share their story. Look at Paul. Acts chapter 9, he shares his story. And then like Acts chapter 26, in the same book, he shares his story again. He talks about how God changed him and saved him. And if you're in here and, and, and in your mind right now, you think, I don't, I don't really have a story. Let's start the story today. Today the story can start. Today you can accept Christ as your Savior and no longer be heading a path to hell, but heading on a path, walking with Jesus, having life eternal. Learn to share your story. Second, learn to share your life. Learn to share your life. Remember the crowd? They turned on Jesus just like that. They'll turn on you too. The crowd turned on Jesus. And they said, where's he going? Who's he hanging out with? I don't believe we're to be a holy huddle. Just hanging out with those who think the same way we think. I think we're called, called to go into the world and to love people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's sharing our life. We share our story, we share our life, and then... We have to share the truth. What is the truth? This is what's so important. Because you can share your story and you can share your life, but here's what you have to learn to share. The salvation of Jesus. That salvation comes only through Jesus Christ dying on the cross and rising again. And accepting him as Savior. That's salvation. He is the way, the only way. He is the truth, the only truth. He is the life, the only life. But it's got to be personal, church. It's not sending people somewhere. It's personal. Christmas Eve gathering, when you were here, it was so awesome, a family came up to me and said, hey, just want to introduce you to someone. She's our neighbor. We brought her with us. And I got so excited. I went, oh. It's personal. I had another family who came to me. We were talking. They're like, you know, we invited our neighbor and they didn't come. I got still excited and I went, hey, it's personal. Talked with a lady this week in, in our church just having conversation that she was talking with somebody else. And she just had a desire and said, you know what? I got to tell this lady about Jesus and gives her the gospel. Why? It is personal. And if we know Jesus, church, it's got to become personal. It's not a one day a week. It's not sending somebody somewhere. It's a one-on-one, -on -one, us going in the world and reaching people with the gospel of Jesus. So 
So I'm going to ask you to do something. Roy talked about this a little bit. On January 30th, we're going to have a seminar. Two hours long, not long. January 30th, 10 o'clock. It's called Learning to Reach Your World. I want you to come. If you know Jesus, I want you to come. I already know how to lead somebody to Christ. Great. Come join with us and help other people. I've already done this class. Great. Come join with us. Help some people. I'm really scared. Great. Come and get some tools so you don't have to be so scared. And on January 30th, Saturday, 10 o'clock, I want you to come here and we're going to join together. Our, the River Church has put this together. It's a two-hour thing. It just gets you started of learning how to personally reach people. I want you to go online today. I want you to sign up today. January 30th. I don't want you to make it. I really want you to come. Got to be honest. I want hundreds of people to come from our location. Why? Because I want it to be personal with us. Jesus saved my life, and I am so selfish if I don't share that with other people. To be transparent with you, reach, gather, grow, gather is easy for me. I love it. I love seeing you and gathering. It's important. It's on the schedule. It never changes. I'd get fired if I didn't show up. But it is gathering with you, and, and whether that's on Wednesday nights or Sundays or, or going to lunch with you, or to, I love that. Growing in the word, the word of God is amazing. But to be transparent with your reach is something I want to get better at. And I, I want to ask you as a church, come with me as we grow in learning to reach pe people better for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you reached us. For many in here who know you as Savior, thanks for saving us. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. And may we grow in this personal relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I want you to do two more things as we wrap up this gathering. There's a card next to you. I want you to grab the card. And I want you to ask the Lord to put somebody on your heart. Who you want, who's on your heart that doesn't know Jesus. I want you to ask the Lord and pray, God, will you put somebody on my heart? And I want you to write their name on that card. I don't want you to put this off. I don't want, if it's personal, I want you to write down their name. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to start praying for that person. I want you to start asking God, God, I'm praying. I'm interceding. I'm asking that this person would come to know Jesus. Now you better be careful with that prayer because God's going to probably open up a door for you to share. Write somebody down. Put that card in your car or at your work or on your desk, mirror at home. Continually pray for that person to know Christ. As we wrap up our gathering, this personal relationship with Jesus, we're going to take communion together. Now, communion, here is a, you'll have we're going to hand out a cracker and grape juice. Now, the Bible talks about communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible says, it explains that Jesus, he, when he died on the cross and he rose again, that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. And we take communion to remember what Jesus did for us. It is just a time that we stop and go, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. And you take that cracker and you remember. And you drink that juice and you remember Christ's saving grace.
and that's what we do. The Bible doesn't say how often. It says as often as you do this, so we do this every so often. In a minute, we're going to have some people come and share, and I know in our world it's a little different, so if you don't want one, just hold up your hand and go, nope, I'm good. Those who are going to share, they'll hand you a cup. They're actually handing you two cups. There's one, the bottom cup has the cracker in it, and the top cup has the juice in it. But you remember. Now, know this. Communion is for those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It is. Maybe this morning, the Holy Spirit has spoke to your heart. And for the first time ever, you want to accept Christ. You can do that right where you're at right now. It is simply by putting your faith in Jesus. Asking him to forgive you of your sins and to save you. And he will. And then take communion with us. This is to remember what he did. If you know Jesus, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do before you take it. The Bible says to examine. Because if you take this flippantly, the Bible says destruction can come. If you just say, it's no big deal, I'm going to take The Bible says, nope, this is very serious. And if you're going to take communion... You examine yourself. I believe that's simply to be you stop and go, God, is there anything I need conviction of? Is there anything here I can repent of? If there's anything I need to go and do after this? And you take those steps to make sure you're good with God and you take communion. The band's going to play a song. I'm going to ask those who are going to pass if you guys will come on up here to do that. I'm going to pray, and we'll do that. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord God, I pray that you would lead us in this personal relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.